Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiara Holliman and Dora Trillo. How y'all doing, ladies? Hello. Hello. Hi, Kiana. Hi, Dora. What's going on, y'all? Y'all, y'all ready for this week? We got, a, we got a bunch of Chief Chats this week. Yes, I'm excited. Yeah, for all excited of for the marathon. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So let, let's let's get the marathon started. Then uh, we got an awesome guest uh, coming up. So without further ado, Kiana, please introduce our next guest. Today we have a U.S. Naval officer, NASCAR driver, entrepreneur, and car enthusiast joining us. He received the NASCAR Divers Driver Award in 2017 and 2018, and he currently competes full time in the NASCAR Xfinity Series under his racing brand. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Navy Lieutenant Commander Jesse Owuji. Hey. <laughs> I love the applause. It's a lot. <laughs> we got you know, to be a little extra on Chief Chat. <laughs> that was great. I love it. <laughs> so, uh, Jesse, thank you for joining us today. And can you let our uh, viewers know where you're coming to us from? Yeah, so I'm coming to you all from Southern California, nice and warm. Actually, it's not too warm today. It's only like 50, 60 degrees, but I guess that's warm for everybody else on the East Coast right now. Mm -hmm. We're probably going through like crazy, really cold temperatures. But uh, yeah, over here in Southern California, just about an hour and some change uh, north of San Diego. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Now, it's time for NASCAR again. And the first race of the Xfinity Series is coming up on February 19th. Um, can you tell us how you've been preparing for this racing season? Yeah, so our first race is actually going to be Daytona at Daytona International uh, Speedway. Um, it's always the first year, uh, first race of the year. Um, we start our season in February right after the Super Bowl. So, you know, we have a nice, long, good you know, time frame where it's, it's it's NASCAR, 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 and you know, no, I guess there's other sports going on, but NASCAR is like to me right now the biggest thing <laughs> happening right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, uh, looking forward to this season. It's going to be a big one uh, as far as like training and getting ready. You know, we started this new team. Uh, in the prior years, I've been racing for other teams really over my entire career, and this year will be the first year where we have our own team that we actually own. You know, me. Emmett Smith, Hall of Famer from uh, um, from the NFL, and also a couple other partners who have jumped on board uh, to be part of the ownership group. And uh, we decided to start our own team for this year because we wanted to have ownership in the sport. Uh, you know, there's only so much you can do as a driver, but we wanted to create a opportunity generating system uh, for uh, something that's going to be able to give people opportunities who maybe would have never thought they would have opportunities in motorsports. And, you know, we're looking to give those opportunities to a diverse group of people, whether they're coming from the military. We have a lot of transitioning service members who are, you know, transitioning from the military to the civilian world. Maybe they're looking uh, for something new to do, something that maybe they can translate some of their skills that they learn in the military to the civilian force. And we're going to eventually have programs where we can get those type of folks in and, uh, and, and work for the team, depending on if that's the route that they want to go. But um, there's a lot of different opportunities here, and that's why we wanted to create this opportunity generating system. Uh, Emmett Smith has been absolutely amazing uh, being part of this whole journey uh, just from start till now, just getting this team together, you know, between the people, the equipment, uh, putting, putting together the right partnerships, because um, uh, at the end of the day, racing costs money and you got to have the right partners on board to be able to make that happen. And uh, we've been able to actually bring on board a lot of great partners. Uh, with uh, EPM, Equity Prime Mortgage being uh, uh, one of the more recent ones. Uh, Chevrolet, uh, we just announced that partnership with them. And we have a few other key and big partners coming up that we're, we will be announcing actually pretty soon. But a lot of great stuff happening to get this team going. Looking forward to racing this NASCAR Xfinity Series uh, this year. Um, I'm the only service member who's still currently serving and racing in NASCAR. And uh, one of two African-Americans as well. Uh, racing in NASCAR, uh, racing full time in NASCAR. We have another one coming up. We'll be racing a little bit this year, and it's great to see him. And hopefully, we have more. So, looking forward to all the great stuff that will happen this year. It's going to be fun. Um, probably ups and downs, but we'll go through it and uh, we'll keep on grinding forward. 
Awesome. So we definitely want to dive a little bit deeper into um, the collaboration with you and Emmett Smith and what's ahead for you this season. But let's go back to the beginning. Um, you grew up in a Dallas suburb at age 17 in a state where Aggies and Longhorns collide. You chose to take a different route with your education, attending the United States Naval Academy. So what influenced your decision to attend the academy? Yeah, so he yeah, decided to go to one of the best schools in the United States, and that's the <laughs> Naval Academy. I'm sorry for all the Army people <laughs> and Air Force people out there, uh, but I decided to go to the Naval Academy. Um, had a really good time there. But what influenced my decision to go there? So in ninth grade, uh, when I was in the early part of my football career, you know, I didn't play Pee Wee football or, um, you know, any Pop Warner or anything like that. My parents didn't have enough time or money to make that happen. Uh, both of my parents are immigrants from Nigeria. And when they came over to this country, they didn't have much at all and had to grind, grind, grind to be able to provide opportunity for their kids me and my two brothers and my sister. So when it came to sports, we, uh, most of us, we, we couldn't play until it was free to play, which was at school. So we decided to make every uh, make, make the most of that opportunity when we did. Started playing in seventh and eighth grade, eventually in ninth grade, eventually made the A team and worked really hard to get better and better in football throughout my high school career because I wasn't that good at first to start. Um, I didn't have a ton of talent. I was um, I had some speed. You know, I was a skinny kid who could run really fast, but uh, didn't I couldn't catch a football to save my life. I couldn't tackle well. I couldn't do all that stuff. And I had to learn. I had to grind and put in a lot of effort every single day to get towards my dream, which was to go play college football. And through that grind, um, all the other kids who were more talented than me, they weren't working as hard to get to their goals. And eventually I surpassed them. Every single day in high school, I would do 100 push-ups. Every single night, I would do 100 sit-ups. I would do 100 calf raisers. I would get a football, lay on my bed, toss it up, and catch it 50 times with my right hand, uh, 50 times with my left hand, until my forearms got stronger and stronger and stronger so I could eventually learn and get the muscle memory of being able to catch a football. And by putting in all that effort every single night, every single day, working out harder than everybody, staying later, doing uh, other other uh, sports in, uh, in high school like track just to help out my speed and get that even faster. All these different things that I put in, all this extra effort and grind every single day was a lot more than all the other kids because they were just worried about going and, and hanging out with other friends and playing and doing a lot of stuff and getting in trouble. And I was worried about getting to college. So all that effort I put in eventually allowed me to surpass them. And all the people who told me that I sucked at football in ninth grade were the same people I called right before my first football game on national TV for the United States Naval Academy freshman year. And I told them, hey, I'm playing tonight. Make sure you watch the game. And 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 <laughs> that was my route to getting there. But I got, re got recruited by the Naval Academy. Uh, you know, decided that it was going to be a great decision for me to go to a school where I can get a great education, uh, play football for a great team, and also be able to serve in the United States Navy uh, after my football career was over. So it was just a win in all different ways. You can't, there's just not too many other places out there in the world besides the other academies where you have a guaranteed career right after you graduate. Like you don't got to go look for a job, you're guaranteed. And if you wanted to, you could stay in for 20, 30 years and just make it a full career. It's, it's, it's absolutely epic. Man. So, so it sounds like the pittiness was on an all time high. You know, you calling those folks that doubted you. Uh, doubted yeah. you <laughs> oh, yeah. I called them. I was calling them, texting them, like, hey, my game's coming up tonight. Hey, my game's coming up tonight. <laughs> Remember you told so, me I sucked? Yeah. <laughs> so, so our headquarters is actually located in Dallas. And so that's where we're at right now. So, which, which high school? Because I know high school is huge uh, here, here in Dallas. So, which high school did you go to? Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, high school football in Texas is absolutely massive and it's only grown. I thought it was massive when I was in high school. It's like even bigger now. But um, yeah, for me, uh, I went to Hebron High School in Carrollton, Texas, and uh, they've been a pretty good team. I believe they're in 5A now. They were in 4A when I played. Um, but uh, yeah, I went to Hebron, played there all four years. Uh, we did really, really well, went to playoffs uh, three of those four years. Um, the year after I left, they actually won the state championship. Man. See, and you, you set them up for success, so that's you know we, we set them up. We put on, we actually went undefeated in the regular season during my senior year, but then first playoff game, uh, this guy named Sergio Kendall, who ended up going to UT and then the Ravens, he uh, he pretty much demolished us. <laughs> <laughs> Sergio awesome. Kendall featuring the Woodrow Wilson Wildcats. <laughs> <laughs> so he. So, uh, so during your time at the Naval Academy, you had a, 
of course, you had a chance to play football and you played safety. So can you tell us what that experience like was like? And um, I know you follow, you still follow your folks. Um, it, it, I, I guess before you answer that question, I got a chance to attend the, the Army Navy game this past uh, this past Army Navy game. And that was my first time being in that atmosphere, man. That and that atmosphere is crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> but it, but I, but I know I know you were pretty happy with the results of that one. But can you just kind of you know walk us through kind of what your experience was like as uh, playing football for the Naval Academy? Yeah, so uh, playing football for Naval Academy was a huge honor, uh, blessing, just the opportunity to play college football, period. But to play football for a team that was doing really well, had really good values, and was just grinders. At the end of the day, um, we weren't the biggest uh, players out there on the field when we played against Ohio State, when we played against Notre Dame and beat Notre Dame twice. We weren't the biggest players out there. We weren't the fastest. We weren't the most talented. But what we always told each other was, hey, even though all these other big schools are recruiting all these five-star athletes, we might be two-star athletes, but we have five-star heart. And that five-star heart was what allowed us to go out there and, and basically outwill these other teams. You know, even though on paper, you know, this guy ran a 4-3, 4-4, he's going, he's projected to go into, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, first round, whatever in the NFL, whatever it was, all these people – had all the stats on paper, but they didn't have everything right here. And and a lot of times, a lot of games, it's it's your will that can win the game. It's not necessarily how talented you are. I mean, you can catch a football well, yeah, but um, you know, if you can't outwill me, you're not going to get away from me. So you know, we we use that to our advantage, and we ended up winning a lot of games. My during my four years at the academy, we went to four bowl games. We beat uh, Missouri for our final bowl game in my senior year. And uh, that, I mean, that same Missouri team, the quarterback was Blaine Gabbert, who, you know, obviously went off to the NFL, played in the NFL, and they had a wide receiver that went up to the league. They had some people on defense. They had a really talented team. They're a Big 12 team, and we, I think we beat them like 40-something to like, I don't even know, like 9 or something or 10. <laughs> we beat them pretty good. That's awesome. I'm, I have a 13-year-old, and I'm, I'm going to make sure he watches this show when he gets off of school today because I love all your – um, you know, talk about hard work and, and everything that um, you've put into your career. Um, now, you served seven years active duty in the Navy, and four of those were served at sea. Um, what were your sea duty experiences like? Yeah, so uh, sea duty was interesting. I learned a lot um, going to the ship, learning how to lead a lot of young men and women, um, and not just young, um, even older, too. I mean, getting coming on the ship, there's people on board who I have to lead who are old enough to be my dad or be my mom. Um, and I'm having to lead these folks fresh out of college, 22 years old, 23 years old. And um, it's a lot of a responsibility because every decision you make uh, could potentially put you or your people or the ship or the mission, the objective, whatever it is, it could put you at risk, could put people's lives at risk. My first ship I was on was a minesweeper. I was on that ship for about two years. I uh, went on one deployment with them for about uh, 10, 10 months. And we were spent most of that time in Bahrain. And then um, my, second, uh, my second ship I was on was an amphib. I was on the USS Comstock. And I was there, uh, I believe, from 2013 till end of 2014, um, almost two years. And I uh, went on one deployment with them for about five months. But um, being on those ships, getting to learn what I got to learn was great. I've taken a lot of the lessons and the skills and, and everything I've learned from that to translate over to what I'm doing now in NASCAR. Before coming on a ship, I used to be super, super shy as far as like public speaking, uh, uh, presenting different um, uh, presenting different uh, uh, briefs and things like that. I used to be really shy. I couldn't do that very well. But coming on, coming on board those ships, you had to get rid of that shyness real quick because anytime you go do any type of operations, any evolutions, there's always these safety briefs or briefs about what's going on. And a lot of times they put the young, you know, junior officers up there to, to lead the briefs. And I had to learn real quick how to present something in a professional manner with confidence and know exactly what I'm talking about and be knowledgeable about it um, and do it in front of the captain and the rest of the ship. So by doing that over and over and over, that allowed me to eventually, like when I came into the NASCAR world, not be nervous in front of a camera or not be nervous, you know, in front of sponsors and this and that, you know, wherever I had to stand up and, and talk, uh, I, I wasn't shy anymore and I could do it. Um, but this is just stuff I learned 
in the military. And, you know, for folks who are in the military and, you know, let's say they're eventually looking to transition out and do whatever they're doing in the civilian world, understand that you have a lot of skills you've learned in the military. You can translate out to the civilian world that other people are not good at at all. Um, I feel like for folks who have served, uh, you just have so many different talents, so many different skills, so many different experiences that people uh, will not ever get in their life who never were in the military or don't get it at such a young age like we do. Um, it, it's it's absolutely incredible. So the military has definitely helped me out a lot in life. Yeah. yeah so, so I, no, so I, no, I got a story. I got a sea duty story for me. Right. <laughs> uh, so in my former life, uh, I was a Marine. And uh, so I was stationed in Camp Lejeune and we went up to Norfolk and, and got we were on an aircraft carrier. And uh, of course, um, being a Marine, I don't think the Navy really put us in the best burden area. They probably found the worst burden area they can find to, to give us to the Marines. Right. And so I could just rem I remember I'm 19 years old. You know, I'm, I'm pretty tall, but still real skinny. Uh, they I got I looked on the on the wall and, and I'm like, I saw these things protruding out of the wall. I'm like, what, man, what are these? They was like, that's your rack. That's your bed. So it's literally like uh, a piece of like, I don't know what, what held them up, but they put me in the middle rack. So the middle rack probably has about, I'd say a good maybe 18 inches between the rack and the rack right above it. And I'm just yep. like, man, if I have if I have a bad dream, man, I'm gonna wake up and just <laughs> oh, it's gonna be home. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of room possible. To anything. So yeah, yeah, that that uh that's that ship life was not was not fun at all. Not for me at least. I'm sure it was I'm sure for the Navy folks it was good to go, but for me, I was like, oh no, this is this is not <laughs> Yeah, uh on the minesweeper, the minesweeper was really small, so uh we had a I, I for half my time on a minesweeper i lived in the nine man birthing so nine people in one birthing and this nine man birthing was the size of i can't i mean shoot i don't even know how many square feet would maybe i don't know it was maybe uh maybe a six foot by 15 foot area or so maybe maybe a little bit bigger than that um yeah. and like nine people nine bunks but that's because we were like three three and three you know and yeah we did not much space and we all lived in there cramped i mean uh minesweeper is only about 224 feet long with 80 something people on board and it's not like it's not like we're all spread out and we sleep all around the ship we're only in this small area for the ship 80 people that's where we all sleep and then you know the rest of the ship is you know for, you know, multiple engines, you got mine sweeping gear, uh, you know, you got the galley, you know, all these different other places. So yeah, it's um, a it, it, difficult life on the ships, but uh, you gotta do what you gotta do because we have to do our part to make sure that we maintain the freedoms that we have in the United States of America. Yeah, so speaking of a skill set, um, it's safe to say that driving is your thing, but you also enjoy taking your car speed up a notch to the next level with an added boost. Um, so we had a chance to Instagram stalk you a little bit and your Instagram feed is filled with pictures of your Chevy Corvette and your Nissan Skyline. So first, what is it about the Corvette that stands out to you? Like out of all the cars you could have purchased and fallen in love with, what was it about the Corvette? And then secondly, can you walk us through the process of taking the power up a few notches on the Skyline? <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, Corvette has, has uh, so I have two Corvettes. I have a C6 Z06 and also a C7 Z06. And I bought the C6 Z06 back in 2013, um, you know, meant to be just a daily driver. And then all of a sudden uh, I decided, you know what, hey, I want to do some track days with it and stuff like that. And, you know, started doing all these track days and had fun doing that. Uh, and that's kind of what led me towards wanting to become a professional race car driver. I started, you know, figuring out, hey, you know, while doing these track days, which are open track days, anybody can go do them, um, you know, safe environment on track, you know, they have fire, fire, uh, medical, um, you know, corner workers, all that stuff. It's a safe place to go do some performance driving without, you know, putting yourself at risk on the streets. And um, after, you know, multiple track days, I finally was like, you know what, I really like this a lot. I would like to take this to the next level. I would like to become a professional race car driver. So I wrote a big goal on my uh, whiteboard to become a pro driver. And from there, I started doing research on how to get in, what keeps people in, what gets people out, how to find sponsorship, how to find funding, how to uh, get more training as a driver to become better as a professional driver, all this stuff. And that's basically kind of what led me towards the NASCAR route. But it all started with that Corvette. And uh, over the years, that Corvette has taken on 
um, this character, this name, this persona, and um, it's now its nickname is Beat Up Vet, uh, the C six zero six. The reason it's called Beat Up Vet is because it's been through so much. I mean, from it has at this moment two hundred and sixteen thousand miles on it, and it's a C six zero six, still same original motor. Um, uh, Transmission's only been changed once because uh, some shop messed up on the fluid change and didn't put enough fluid in it, and, and yeah, that was a mess. But um, <laughs> what, yeah, the car has been through so much, but it actually helped me get into the NASCAR world. My C7 Z06, I just recently bought that um, about a year ago. That car is a beautiful car. I love it. It's super fun. Um, I just love the C7s. They're awesome. The C8 has just came out recently. Uh, I'm waiting for the C8 Z06 to come out so I can buy that and I can have my C6 Z06, C7 Z06, and C8 Z06. Um, now, as far as the Skyline, Skyline, it's a fun car. I bought it uh, early to, uh, early 2020. Um, you know, done a lot of stuff to build that motor up. You know, it's a fully built RV26 single turbo, um, uh, making 20 something pounds of boost. It's an actually animal. People love it because it's a GTR. And people just love GTR, so it's a cool car. But I'm um, having more fun with the, uh, with the with the Corvette stuff. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's uh, it's funny you 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 talk about racing, right? And so I'm thinking about on active duty. I'm, of course, I'm currently on active duty, but uh, I haven't done it like here recently. But back in the day, we used to fill out these high risk activities uh, that we had to do. So <laughs> we decided to go do something stupid on the weekend. We had to fill out the <laughs> this form right to let everybody know mm -hmm. hey i'm gonna do something, something stupid <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta let my supervisor know that i'm about to so I'm, all i'm envisioning is you saying you know what i'm about to go race this corvette on active duty i'm just gonna race it on the weekends and probably not report it but you know it's you know it is what it is so yeah so i'm uh, just trying the, to figure uh, out <laughs> yeah no, go the, ahead um the the so the vet okay so this is the thing when, when I started doing the track days with the vet unfortunately uh, it's not really a race you know so these are uh, open track they don't make it a race because they know if you make something actual competition then people are fighting to win and they do dumb things and they can crash and all that stuff whereas these track days are uh, basically uh, they divide you up in these groups and for twenty minutes at a time. You know, they let a certain amount of vehicles on the track and you can go drive the track, learn how to drive the track, all that stuff. And there's no um, there is no like competition. It, you 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 could drive as fast as you want to drive at your skill level. Um, if you want to go slow, you can go slow. If you want to go fast, you fast. And they try to pair people in groups of how skilled they are in a way. Like if they see that you can't really keep up, they want to put you in a group that's beginners. If they see that you obviously have some skill, they'll put you in a more advanced group. But um, there's no real competition. So um, I w that's why after doing that, I felt like, okay, I want to get out of this and I want to get into real competition. Obviously, I wasn't going to be able to use my personal car for a real competition. So I jumped up into a real race car to do competition. Okay, gotcha. So, so we you were still on active duty when you wrote down that goal to say, you know what, I want to be a professional race car driver, and you kind of was like, you know what, I was, uh, you know, I know, I know the reserves was obviously your 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 choice, but I think, but you were still on active duty when you kind of made that decision that you know what, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna transition to the reserves so I can do this full time. Yeah, uh, so I was I was still on active duty. It was in uh, when I, I made the decision that I wanted to go after professional racing in the beginning of 2014. I was still on the ships at that point, about to go on my second deployment. I knew I wasn't going to start racing that year, but I wanted to make the decision and start figuring out what I had to do to get there, so that by shore duty, which my shore duty was coming up the next year, 2015. At that point, I was going to be able to start racing. So 2014 was going to be more of just a research and learn year. I feel like any dream, any goal you have in life, um, you know, initially you got to have the vision. You got to clearly see yourself doing it. And then after you clearly see yourself doing it, you have to insanely and obsessively believe that it's going to come true no matter what. And then from there, you got to put action towards it every single day. So now you now when you're putting that daily action towards every day, that's what I was doing. So I already, I already got past the vision. I already I saw myself becoming a pro driver. That's why I wrote it on the whiteboard. And then I fully, insanely and obsessively believed that it was going to happen no matter what, because I already saw it. If I, if I see it, that means it's done. The deal's already done, you know, years from now. So 
I believe it's going to happen. So once I did that, then every day I was putting action. So I was doing research at first just to learn about all the opportunities in the racing world. What are all the different series out there? What are all the different genres of racing? You have sports car racing, formula racing, stock car racing, monster truck, uh, bikes. What, there's all these different forms of racing. So I had to figure out what line I wanted to go into. I narrowed it down to a few groups. And then from there, I started doing more research. I, I would go onto websites for different series and all the drivers they have listed. I would find the driver's names, go on Facebook because Instagram was still like small at that time. Not everybody had Instagram. <clears throat> Went on Facebook and I would DM every single driver who were on each series list and ask them questions on, hey, uh, how'd you get into racing? What's your story? And how can someone like me get into racing? I think of the hundreds and hundreds of drivers I reached out to, only a few actually answered. And um, they gave me some good advice. I took their knowledge and, and just kept on going from there. But um, yeah, like once you have a goal, once you have a dream, you have to put in that level of energy to get there. And as long and while you're putting that action towards it, you're going through this tunnel. The tunnel is going to be dark uh, throughout my first few years, grinding to get into racing and and to race every single year and race all the races I could. Going through that tunnel, there was a lot of um, there's a lot of pitfalls in that tunnel. It's dark. Uh, you can't see anything. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. People are going to try to stab you. People are going to try to take you out. People are going to try to pull you back to the beginning of the tunnel. Um, you know, there might be snakes there, whatever. But it's dark. And as you're going through it, you got to that's where that whole faith comes into play, because you already initially when you went into the tunnel, when you started the tunnel, you went in there because you already clearly saw the end. You already saw the light like you saw in the future that you were going to become something. So as you're going through a tunnel, you have to just keep that faith strong that no matter how dark it is here, that light is still there. The light hasn't disappeared. It's always there. And by the time you get to the end of the tunnel, when you're like two inches, three inches away from that tunnel, um, it's still going to be pitch black. You're not going to be able to see anything still. A lot of people at that point quit. They're like, oh, you know what? This is not going to work. And then they go walk miles and miles and miles back to the beginning for what? I don't know. It doesn't make mm -hmm. sense. When you're only a couple of inches away, so keep pushing. And once you finally get into the light, all of a sudden you've achieved success. You achieved what you wanted to do, and now you finally made it in life and wherever you want to go. And that's basically what I did to get into NASCAR. Start also start multiple businesses. Um, you know, I have a trucking company now. I have a drag racing events company now. I have a esports events company now. I real estate invest. I have an app. Um, I have a media productions company. I have. Uh, the race team and some other stuff i'm forgetting <laughs> that's awesome we are loving your message about just seeing that that light at the end of the tunnel and just going for it um but one of the things you mentioned um at the start of the show is that you partnered with one of our favorites emmett smith last summer taking your brand yeah. to the next level how'd that relationship form and what can you know fans expect to see in the upcoming racing season yeah, so uh, partnering with Emmett Smith and um, how that whole thing started was back in twenty, uh, end of twenty twenty. One of his companies was one of my sponsors for one of my races, and uh, after that, you know, we were me and my agent at that time, uh, Matt Casto, who's also still my agent now. Um, we uh, we were talking about, you know, what in order for us to really build some type of real legacy and and really create lasting change, we need to own our own race team. Like we can't keep running for all these other teams. We'll never really have a say so in anything, and life will only go as far as they let us. So we decided, you know what, we need to start our own race team. But instead of us just doing it ourselves and that's it, why don't we bring in someone who has a lot of wisdom and experience in the business world, someone who has a great influence, not only in the, in the Dallas area, but a great influence in uh, really on the country. I mean, he uh, all time leading rusher, you know, one of the best NFL players to ever play. Why not bring someone like that in uh, who, who has just a, just a massive network, a massive reach, a massive audience, someone who could really help us elevate this whole thing, who had our same goals and values um, with him. And, and Emmett was the guy. Uh, my agent has has actually known Emmett for 20 plus years now. And uh, so that that relationship right there made it a little bit easier to get connected with him. We spoke to him, let him know exactly what our goals were with the team. He loved it. He was fully on board with it. He was in line. He wanted to figure out a way to create lasting change. I mean, he's already played. He's played in the NFL. He's done all the stuff he needs to do. You know, he has his businesses. He does a lot of real estate investing and development and all that. He's doing great in life. He wants to figure out ways to give back and really create a legacy. And um, this race team was just one of the ways that we could all make it happen together. 
we came together and we made the announcement in August of 20 last year, 2021. And once we made the announcement, it actually went pretty viral. Uh, I had friends who, who contacted me and they're like, Hey, like I, my ESPN app just like, you know, did the whole da, 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 and your name <laughs> pops up. I'm like, Oh man, that's cool. <laughs> so, um, the announcement went really pretty far and, um, you know, we're, we're one of the few minority owners, um, uh, in NASCAR, uh, there's not a lot of uh, owners in NASCAR who own teams who are minorities. Uh, we're one of the few, so it's great that we're helping diversify the sport and bringing in uh, new, fresh faces who maybe would have never paid attention to racing or NASCAR before. Now, you know, maybe they're only football fans. Maybe they're only fans of them, and maybe they're only fans of me. Maybe they're only fans of the military. Whatever it is. Um, they're now going to have their eyeballs on the screen watching these NASCAR races and coming to these races. And we're going to be able to utilize our platform to inspire a lot of folks. And like I said earlier in the, in the broadcast, um, using this platform to create an opportunity generating system to help support diversity, help support uh, military transitioning members, help support kids, um, all, the, all, the, all these different avenues we can really jump into, communities we can go into. Um, we now have a team where we can do that. Now, obviously all that stuff isn't gonna happen day one. We gotta get the team off the ground and actually go race <laughs> this weekend. Um, but as we're going, we're, these, these programs are developing, we're putting together the right people to make things happen. Um, and it's just gonna be a, just a huge journey that's gonna really benefit a lot of people. Uh, we're not looking to just build a skyscraper of a team. Uh, we're looking to build a skyline. We wanna build something that builds uh, opportunities for others so that they can go wherever they want in life, whether that's with us or whatever route they're trying to go. Yeah, that's exciting. So speaking of racing, um, I guess in this season, who has been a source of healthy competition for you during your time in NASCAR? And I guess who are you looking forward to, you know, um, defeating this season? <laughs> You know what? So um, I try not to look at other teams like that, other drivers or anything like that. Um, they're all really good drivers. All the other teams out there, they're great teams. Um, everybody puts in a ridiculous amount of effort, energy, money, time, blood, sweat, tears into their programs to make them better and better and better. So for me, um, you know, I, I don't really have anyone that I'm just really comparing myself to. Not right now. We're still too new. I'm still too new to the sport. I've only been in for a few years and I'm still learning. I have way less experience than everybody else. So my goal is to go out there and my competition is myself. I need to beat myself every single race. I need to be better than I was the last week. I need to grow. I need to become a better driver. I need to not let um, you know any any thoughts or any nervousness or any this and that in my mind. You know, block off my ability to be the best I can be. So really, the fight is against me every single week. And as I become better and defeat me and and keep pushing forward, then that's going to allow the team to also continue to push forward. And, and be the best it can be. I, I challenge everyone on the team, hey, beat yourself each day, be better than yourself each day, grind, be better than it was yesterday. It, every week's a new week, just because you might, might have gotten a victory the week before, you're one and oh, that week before, once a new week comes, you reset, you're oh and oh, and you gotta start the next week again. So that's how I approach it. So you mentioned earlier, um, you got a, a bunch of ventures that you got going on, right? So you, that means you got a lot of, a lot of irons in the fire, uh, like you got a trucking company and an esports company. So, what what was your motivation to expand in all these different industries? I know that's that's a that's a lot to uh, keep track of, uh, but but I'm I'm sure you you got a, a good a good story on, on you know why you wanted to kind of venture out in all these different areas. Yeah, um, when I first started in racing, uh, started in NASCAR, uh, I had to figure out the funding side of it because uh, it costs money. It costs money to race. It's not free. Tires aren't free. You know, people aren't free. You know, they're not going to come work on your team for free. Uh, you know, transporting a vehicle, getting them prepped, parts, pieces. You know, if you get the vehicle damaged during the race, which is a real thing, you know, crashes happen, damage happens. Um, all that stuff just costs money. So when when I was initially going to these teams to try to run for their teams, you know, they would tell me, hey, to run for us, uh, we need a certain amount of funding to make it happen. I know everybody wants to think that these owners just have the money sitting there and they're just spending money to go race. Like some do, but it's not a common thing. You'll go broke pretty quick. Uh, you, got, you, you have to have the right sponsorship or funding coming from somewhere. So for me, being a new driver, I didn't have a lot of sponsorship opportunities early. I had a few folks who gave me a few dollars here and there, at least in the early stages, but I didn't have a lot. Family, friends maybe helped out a little bit, but I didn't have a lot. So I had to figure out a way to self-fund myself 
being in the Navy as an officer, I made decent money, but I didn't make enough money that I was going to pay for racing. So uh, what I did was I started a business on the side and I started hosting these events at drag strips and the events I was hosting, I was able to utilize um, any extra profits from those to help support my racing career. And these events, uh, these these events were helping bring people who were, you know, getting involved in like street racing and all that stuff and doing dangerous, dangerous stuff on the streets. It was bringing them from the street to the track where they could be in a safer environment where uh, you can race, you know, in between, you know, in between the lines and you weren't, you know, on the streets, maybe putting other people's lives at risk in unsafe environments. I mean, you see all these crashes that happen. People go on 150 miles per hour, you know, down whatever lane and something happens and they crash into a, a semi truck or a family or something like that. And it's all bad. If you can bring it to a track, bring it to a drag strip where it's a legal place to do it. There's actual, you know, safety barriers there where if anything happens, you'll just, you maybe you'll, you'll, you'll glance your car against the barrier or hit the barrier, but it's a lot better than, you know, hitting, going through an intersection and, and hitting an innocent person. So, um, uh, we were putting on these events. They were working. A lot of people were coming to watch the events. Um, you know, we charge for tickets for people to come in and race, people to spectate, people to be on a pit crew, uh, a car show, you name it. So any extra profit I made from that, I uh, basically use it to sponsor myself. And then from there, that built the entrepreneurship spirit in me, which allowed me to pretty much from there go and uh, start my other business ventures. So decided to get into real estate investing because I learned that you should always take try to take your active income and uh, put into a passive income generating stream. And I felt real estate was going to be the way to do that. Um, we also started, uh, me and my brothers came together and started a trucking company. Um, we felt like it was a great opportunity to jump into an industry where there was plenty of opportunity. They, there's, there's no shortage of opportunity <clears throat> in the trucking industry. At the end of the day, all these companies need things shipped around. Everybody needs stuff shipped around. Um, there's no way to just fly all that stuff around. It costs too much money. There's no way to put it on some floating uh, floating ship that just you know floats and flies around. And like, there's just no way to do it. It has to be on ground. Train isn't enough. Um, you need semi trucks. And I figured, you know what? That means there's always going to be opportunity there for at least a foreseeable future. And uh, we started a trucking company. That's been going really well. And then from there, it just allowed me to just continue to open up doors. Like money made in certain areas, I could use to start other things. Esports is huge. It's massive. We started uh, this thing called the E Racing Association, and with E Racing Association, what we're able to do is put on these massive events where um, drivers can come in at home, whether they're doing our Mario Kart events with their Nintendo Switch, or they're doing a Gran Turismo on their PlayStations, or they're doing I Racing on the PC. They come together, compete in their events, and can win cash prizes. So uh, these cash prizes that people have been able to win, we have people who have taken home eight thousand dollars in a year uh, from just winning some events. <laughs> so it's 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 pretty cool to see how much money you can actually win from your house. You don't even have to step outside the house. You can literally go in a room, play in a tournament, win money. Um, so that's what e racing association is about. And then you know, obviously, I've jumped into some other business ventures too as well. Um, and uh, it's just been fun. You know, we'll continue to grow and grow and grow as much as I can, at least as much as uh, as much as I can do to fill my plate. <laughs> Yeah, I, that I, that's amazing. But on top of all of that, you were promoted to Lieutenant Commander of the United States Navy Reserves at Charlotte Motor Speedway in 2020. So how do you balance the racing, serving in the military and, you know, all your entrepreneur um, it, it, adventures that you're involved in? Yeah, uh, the balance um, is a lot. Yeah, so I just got promoted to Lieutenant Commander. Um, my friend Dale er Earnhardt Jr. He was at uh, my 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 pinning ceremony, um, which was awesome to see him. You know, take some time out of his day to come do that, and um, also had uh, uh, Ad uh, Admiral Buck for the Naval Academy. He actually uh, was uh, basically my my oath officer. He was you know he said the oath for me, and that was pretty awesome. But um. Being uh, uh, being able to balance all this stuff is not easy at all. It's definitely 
Uh, it takes a lot of time. You got to divide up your day, uh, understand how many hours of sleep you need, and then from there, divide up the rest of the day on you know physical fitness, business, uh, your business ventures, racing training, um, all that stuff has to be divided out throughout the day. So typically, I try to get six to seven hours of sleep each day, and then from there, divide out the rest of the day equally so that I can make all this stuff happen. Uh, now I'm in the reserve, so obviously I'm not doing racing. Full, or, sorry, I'm not doing uh, um, the Navy full time anymore. But um, that still takes up some weekends. There's some weekends where I'll, I, I've raced on a Friday night and done my Navy drill Saturday and Sunday. Um, it just it's just how it works out sometimes. So uh, I do have a lot of busy weeks, busy weekends. But at the end of the day, I was the one who was saying, you know what, I'm hungry. So how can I complain when my plate gets full? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, and it's lunchtime too. So I'm glad you mentioned uh, mentioned plates. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you got a very, very captive audience today. Um, we got the whole military community kind of watching live with us right now, and possibly we got some people out there that want to join the racing game or, or start their own business. So, what message would you like to share? Uh, even though you've been dropping nuggets the whole day, so we definitely appreciate that. But any any yeah. specific message you want to share with the nation's heroes today? Yeah, uh, for those listening who are interested in doing anything, what, whatever goal you have in life, whether it's business stuff, in the military, maybe you want to become the next CNO or, you know, uh, in the Navy, the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, whatever it is, you know, or if you're an Air Force, Army, whatever, wherever you want to go, whether it's in the military or, you know, deciding to transition out at some point, whatever goals you have, um, at the end of the day, um, understand that uh, what you think about, you bring about. So you have to understand that your mind is a very, very powerful thing. And you can really put yourself in a lot of great positions in life just with mindset. Uh, you can also put yourself in very bad places in life with a bad mindset. So your mind is a very powerful thing. What you think about, you bring about. But understand that thoughts only aren't just going to get you somewhere. It first starts with having a powerful mindset and, and understanding that you are willing to go after a goal and dream you're willing to do whatever is necessary to get there no matter what you're willing to trip and fall as many times as necessary um you're willing to cut the ropes burn the burn the the the, the rowboats behind you and have no way of going back like if you're willing to do all that stuff you've now you know at least gotten the right mindset to start going after any particular goals and dreams and after you, and as you're going there um you know you just got to maintain that faith continue to put action every single day towards the goals continue to network, expand, find different ways to do it, find better ways to do it. Even if it's going well, you still got to find better ways to do it. You just got to continue to grow and expand. And there will be naysayers. Uh, there will be people who tell you you can't do something for whatever reason. Um, it's happened to me throughout my journey many, many times. People saying, yeah, you can't achieve that. You can't get to that. You can't do that. But um, understand that only you were given a vision to go to whatever go to wherever you're supposed to go. Only God put that vision in your mind. So since he only put it in your mind, nobody else can see it. I was given my vision to become a professional race car driver. Nobody else was given that vision. So no one else can see it. And because they can't see it, they can't really believe it. And because they can't believe it, they're going to tell me that it's not possible. And that's okay. You can tell me as much as you want that it's not possible. That's okay. You were never given my vision, so I can't even fault you. I was given that vision. I'm the only one who can see it. I see the map. You weren't given the map. I'm not giving you the map either. Like I'm not going to take what out of my mind and give it to you if you don't want to believe it. I'm going to go after it myself. So understand that just because others are telling you you can't does not mean that they are right. They are incorrect. If you we're given a vision. You clearly see yourself becoming whatever you're supposed to become, achieving whatever you're supposed to achieve. Understand that you and only you were given that vision. So you have to see it for yourself. They're not going to see it for you. So no matter what anybody, whether it's family, uh, your brothers, sisters, mom, dad, sometimes will be the closest people to you who tell you you can't do something. They weren't given that vision. So it's OK. I'm, you can't see it. Like I'm, It's OK. Like I can see it. So go after it no matter what anybody else uh, says uh promise you you'll achieve it just like i said before you got to insanely obsessively believe that you can achieve it and then you put action towards it every day with faith throughout that tunnel as much as you're going to trip and fall and and as dark as you'll get remember that the sun will still rise even in the darkest point of the night the sun will still come back out keep pushing forward there's new days every day and that was that's what's going to help you achieve whatever you want in life um, none of these like five steps that these gurus tell you on YouTube and stuff like that. This mindset stuff that I just told you is what's going to help you achieve anything in life. 
Yeah, you know, that's a major mic drop right there. Great advice, um, even for us, you know. Um, growth and evolution are super important, especially when you do have, you know, a dream. You have a starting point, but it's, like you said, it's important to just kind of keep the fuel going, right, and keep that vision moving forward. So when it comes to you, what's ahead for you? So when you see your vision right now, where do you see it going? Do you have anything coming up on the horizon that had just recently come up um, based on your own vision? Yeah, so uh, for me, the future, what it holds is, um, you know, we started this race team and this race team is going to go on and on and on for years and years and years. Eventually, we're going to advance this race team to the NASCAR Cup Series, which is the next step above where I'm at right now and the top level of NASCAR. We're going to go there, we're going to race, and, and the goal is to eventually uh, win races and become a champion in the sport. Um, after doing that for me, the race team will still go. We'll have other people driving for the race team, but I'm going to branch off probably in the next 10 years or so uh, to the Hollywood world and start, uh, you know, basically acting and, and starring in big blockbuster films. I could see myself in Transformers movies, uh, Fast and Furious, um, you know, the Marvel movies. I love the Marvel movies. If I, if I, I'll figure out a way to get in with Disney and, and become part of the, the whole MCU. But um, yeah, I, I could see myself being in big action films. I love stuff like that. I love filming. I love being part of that. Um, it's just the whole process, putting it together and just putting, you know, fantasy to, you know, film on screen. It's just, it's cool to me. I love it. So definitely want to be part of that world eventually. But right now we got work to do. We got a mission and that's in the racing world. And we're going to continue to drive lasting change and create opportunities for all. Man, you need a stunt double? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I want, to, I want to do some of my own stunts, but I, I might need some doubles for it. If, if it's anything that's super crazy, like, you know, I don't know, like swimming with sharks, I'd be like, yeah, so I need a double. You got this. If it's driving, oh, I'm all in. That's awesome. Big, big, big vision and big dreams. I, I love it. Now, um, I wanted to share something. You're getting amazing reception on our live feed because I, I think we told you this was live. Um, but I'd like to yeah. share some of oh, the Oh, it's live? Oh, whoa. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you're watching you. We've got um, one just to share some of them with you. Uh, Marissa, uh, Marissa from Carrollton, actually. Uh, what kind of car do you drive And uh, you know, when you're not racing? And what's your dream car? We have um, Ryan, he says, we would love to have you at Scott Air Force Base when you race in June. Um, so we've got an invitation there. We also have, um, let's see, I know I saw somebody else. Um, Jeffrey Foster, he wants to, he hopes to see you in person um, one of these days. Somebody, let's see, Tom Cunningham says, room. They're just all excited that you're on the show with us today. Um, we had John um, agree with a lot of the messages you were given out today by saying amen to that. Jesse, keep the faith. Um, so again, lots of people watching today. Um, we've got Michelle. She says, we'll see you next weekend at the Auto Club Speedway. They'll be there in yeah. the infield. Um, lots of fans watching watching our show today. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, most definitely. No, thank you for everybody who's tuning in to watch this. And hopefully I've been able to give you a lot of great information to help you achieve whatever you're trying to achieve in life. And um, you know, looking forward to racing this year and, and doing all the other stuff that we're going to have going on. But, um, you know, hopefully everyone's following on, on you know, social media. Um, my name is on all my social media channels, so you don't have to look for any funky usernames or anything like that. Just look up my name, Jesse Wuchi. That's a J-E-S-S-E. Uh, last name is I W U J I. You just look it up on all the social media platforms from Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, all that stuff. You'll find all my pages on there. Um, if it's uh, if you see something that's like a Jesse Wuji like fan page, like it says like fan page or something, I didn't create that. But uh, any other stuff, for the most part, I created it. <laughs> Listen, it, it, it's not a bad thing if you got a fan. <laughs> Somebody no, created a fan. No. That's got to be a yeah, good thing. No, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. But, you know, I can't control what other people put out there. So uh, if they create a fan page and start putting funky stuff out there, I can't control that. So <laughs> so also, I just want to kind of uh, I, I went on my page and, and saw a couple of comments. But uh, Eddie Matthew Gates says, see you in Talladega. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And so so Eddie, Eddie's ready. He, he's he's yeah. ready. So so. Yeah. Uh, so uh, kind of some housekeeping stuff. Uh, so for our Chief, Chief Chat viewers, this episode will be, will be available on YouTube and Spotify. 
Uh, you can re rewatch this with your friends or catch up on past episodes. Also, be sure to join us on uh, February 17th as we welcome soap star and Hallmark movie actress Allison Sweeney at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time and, and actor Shannon Tatum at 1.15 p.m. Central Standard Time. So, like I said, we got a we got an awesome uh, lineup this week. We got three. You no, know, we normally do once a week, but uh, this time this time we got three. But we got three amazing guests. So, um, man, Jesse, so much. It, thanks so much for joining us today. It, you dropped us. You, you gave us a lot of nuggets, and and I'm just thinking about you doing 100 push-ups and 100 crunches uh, every single day, then throwing the football up and and hitting hitting the, hitting the ceiling. I don't know how your mom felt about it, but uh, <laughs> I try not to hit the ceiling. I got as close as I could. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. But uh, man, it's. <laughs> I can see the obsessive, like compulsive, like I got to get this done. I got to get better. I got to better myself. And so, like you said, that's the winning formula for anything that you want to do in life. As long as you just say, you know what, I'm not going to make any excuses. I'm going to do do it and I'm going to keep doing it and keep doing it. And you had that muscle memory. And so uh, you were able to, you know, get on the football team and and then go to the Naval Academy and then go to NASCAR. And, and then I'm sure you'll be going to be taking over for Tyrese as the chief mass sergeant on Transformers. Hopefully they put some Navy component in there. All of a sudden that could be like, you know, the Lieutenant Commander or Commander, but they'll probably be Commander by that time. Commander by that yeah. time, you know, and I'm, all of a sudden I'm taking the Navy in to go fight against Megatron. And you know. <laughs> <laughs> But no, we, just, we, we appreciate your time and we appreciate, uh, you know, uh, which what, what you're doing for the military community uh, thank you for your service as well and um thank you know you. just good good luck to you in, in your future endeavors and good luck new uh this new season that's coming up like you said football season once fo football season goes away everybody you know has this collective sigh because uh you know they, they they we love our sports in america so uh uh you know thanks for for bringing us another sport in uh you know after football season yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. Everyone tune in. They told us this Saturday, uh, Saturday evening. I don't, can't remember what time, but um, yeah, Saturday. There's multiple races, by the way, for anyone's confused with NASCAR. They have NASCAR Truck Series on Friday, NASCAR Xfinity on Saturday, NASCAR Cup Series on Sunday. So any of my races, for the most part this year, they'll be on Saturdays if you're trying to tune in. So don't, uh, don't get them confused. <laughs> you won't see me on Sundays yet. You know, I might race some Friday races too, but you won't see me on Sundays just yet. <laughs> yeah, it's it's coming though. We're gonna name it and claim it. So uh yeah. once again, if you don't mind staying out staying on just a little bit longer after the live uh ends, uh just to kind of say our formal goodbyes, but uh just wanna wish you all the best and thank you for your time and uh chief chat out.